Today, for the third time in 24 hours, a military base inside Russia was attacked. Moscow blamed Ukraine for what appears to be the deepest strikes inside Russia since the war began. Meantime, the drive for accountability for Russian war crimes in Ukraine continues. In a moment, Nick Schifrin will speak with a leading Ukrainian human rights activist. But first, he joins me here at the desk. So, Nick, hello. What do we know about these targets that were struck inside of Russia, and what about weapons used in those attacks? The target today was an oil field near uh, an airfield uh, in southern Russia. Uh, the Russian governor said multiple drones struck it. You can see it on fire right there. And the location was Kursk. That is about 50 miles from the Ukraine-Russia border. You see it right there. And what's significant there is the pattern and location of the attacks yesterday on a Russian base in Saratov. That is 372 miles from the Ukrainian border. That base hosts nuclear-capable long-range bombers that have bombed Ukraine. And the Russian base in Ryazan is 350 miles from the Ukraine border. Now, Ukraine is not taking public credit for these, but it is giving hints. Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov earlier today on Ukrainian TV joked that maybe Russian soldiers were smoking near flammable objects. The enemy very often keeps violating safety rules. They smoke in different dangerous places. And very often we hear a word that is sweet to every Ukrainian's ear, cotton, meaning that they had it. And it's a symbol of our victory. The cotton, he said, reminds him of the smoke that appeared above the bases that were attacked inside Russia. So a little bit of a taunt, but neither confirming nor denying. The officials I talked to say that Ukraine did conduct these attacks with drones that they essentially create with technology that they patch together, not with any kind of U.S. weapon. And in fact, the Biden administration has refused Ukraine's uh, requests to send them the longest range best weapons that they have for fear of escalation, for fear that these kinds of attacks, frankly, could escalate the war. But today, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken was very clear. He, he said that these attacks inside Russia needed to be seen in context. We have neither encouraged nor enabled uh, the Ukrainians to uh, strike inside of Russia. Uh, but the important thing is to understand what Ukrainians are living through every day with the ongoing Russian aggression against their country. And to give you a sense of how important these strikes are, British intelligence uh, in the UK said today that the most, they are the most strategically significant failures of force protection since the war began. Hmm, interesting. How are the Russians responding to all this? trying to create the, the same terror that they have been trying to create for months. Uh, the Russians launched dozens, nearly 100, according to one Ukrainian official, uh, strikes on civilian homes, uh, on the power and heating infrastructure, as they have been doing. Half of Kyiv had no electricity earlier today. Odessa had to rely fully on generators. And the Kremlin spokesman today even said that there were no prospects for peace, that Russia must achieve its stated goals. Uh, but today in Ukraine, uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky was defiant. He's there visiting a city near the front line, giving Ukrainian soldiers awards. He said the country deserved to gain victory and deserved to gain justice. And one of the organizations uh, helping Ukraine achieve justice is the Kyiv-based Center for Civil Liberties. This Saturday, it will receive the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Norway. Its head is Oleksandra Matvichuk. I spoke with her a few time ago and began by asking her why a human rights lawyer and Nobel Peace Prize recipient was calling for more weapons. I'm a human rights lawyer who have been applying the law to defend people for many years, but now, I and other Ukrainian human rights defenders are doing our job in cir circumstances when the law doesn't work and the whole UN system is enabled to stop Russian atrocities. We have no legal instrument even to release one single person from captivity. So the truth is, if we want to stop murder and torture in occupied territories, we need weapons to liberate them. When I was in Liberated Kharkiv uh, a few months ago, uh, I saw Russian torture okay. chambers, and Russian soldiers had left behind the devices of dehumanization, uh, the wire that they used to strangle Ukrainians, the electricity uh, that they used to torture Ukrainians. Uh, have these crimes occurred nearly everywhere that Russia has occupied? Yes, and for all these eight years, 
I have, since 2014, since yes, the initial invasion. when the war started in 2014, I uh, interviewed more than 100 of people who survived captivity, and they told me horrible stories. They told me how they were beaten, how they were raped, how their fingers were cut, how their nails were torn away, their nails were drilled, they were tortured with electricity, compelled to write something with their own blood. One woman tell, told me how her eye were dug out with a spoon. You have been documenting these horrors, as you just described, for many years. Uh, now you uh, have created an initiative that has documented more than 24,000 alleged war crimes. How shocking is that scale? It's enormous amount of crimes, which means the enormous amount of pain. Because we document not just violations of Geneva Hague conventions, we document human pain. Human pain when Russian troops deliberately shell in residential buildings, schools, churches, hospitals, attack evacuation corridors, manage filtration camp system, organize forcible deportations, commit murder, rape, torture, abductions, and other kinds of offenses against civilians. You uh, and senior Ukrainian officials have consistently talked about creating a special tribunal uh, in order to achieve justice. Why is the International Criminal Court not enough? International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over crimes as aggression is. Crime of aggression. Yes, we need additional international mechanism to prosecute for such kind of crimes. But we need even more. We need international tribunal which can cover the crimes of war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Because now we face with a accountability gap in Ukraine. What do I mean? The national system is overloaded with an extreme amount of crimes. And International Criminal Court will limit its investigation only to several select cases. So the question is, who will provide chance for justice for the hundreds of thousands of victims who will not be lucky to be selected by International Criminal Court? But is the goal in a special tribunal, and specifically the crime of aggression, which the ICC does not have jurisdiction over, is the goal to hold senior officials to account, including Vladimir Putin himself? Yes, Putin and rest political senior leadership, as well as high military command. For the first time, the European Commission has endorsed your call for a special tribunal, but the U.S. has still not endorsed a special tribunal, and, and there are officials I speak to here who are worried that it could take a long time to create a special tribunal from scratch and that it could dilute the work of the ICC. What do you say to those worries? We live in very interconnected, very complex, and a very quick world. Okay, if before the international tribunals takes too much time, we have these lessons learned why we can do it faster. Meaning you want justice to be achieved during the war itself? Yes, because why we look into the world through the prism of Nuremberg Tribunal when the Nazi tri war criminals were tried after Nazi regime had collapsed? Justice has to be independent on the magnitude of Putin's regime power. Do you think the West has failed to hold Putin to account in the past, long before even 2014, for example, in Syria, Chechnya, etc.? I'm sure that all this hell which we now faced in Ukraine is a result of total impunity which Russian troops have in Chechnya, in Moldova, in Syria, in Mali, in Libya, in Georgia, in other countries of the world. They, like, have never been punished. Russians believe they can do whatever they want. Just last weekend, we heard something from French President Emmanuel Macron. He said that the end of the war would require Russian security guarantees. Are you concerned the international community is more concerned in peace than in justice? International community has to take a truth and to understand that there will not be sustainable peace in our region without justice. Because we speak about culture of impunity. We speak about situation when Russia for decades used war as a tool how to achieve geopolitical interest and war crimes as the methods how to win the war. And is it just for your region or do you think that this is a global fight? How important is it 
for the fight overall uh, against authoritarianism, do you think, that Ukraine finds just? It's a global fight, because this war has a very distinct value dimension. And Putin, he tried to convince not only Ukrainians, but the whole world, the rule of law, democracy, freedom are fake values. Because if they are genuine, why they not protect you during the war? And other authoritarian leaders of the, in the world can be inspired by this example. Oleksandr Matvichuk, thank you very much. Thanks.